Hello, everyone. My name is Albert Cohen. I will be chairing this session, and it's a pleasure for me to present our plenary speaker this morning, Gita Kutunyok. Gita received her diploma and PhD degree for, from University of Paderborn in Germany and her habilitation in 2006 at Justus Labic Universitat from Gießen. Uh, she is quite well known for her contributions in approximation theory, uh, where she in particular introduced uh, the notion of shearlets uh, a generalization of a wavelet adapted to, to geometry. And she broadened then her scope in uh, various directions such as sparse recovery, compressed sensing, image processing, optimization. And more recently, she made significant contribution to the mathematical foundation of deep learning and also its application in inverse problem. Um, she is now chair of uh, Bavarian uh, Artificial Intelligence Chair from Mathematical Foundation of Artificial Intelligence at the Ludwig Maximilian University, Munich. And uh, she has received many awards. Uh, listing all of them will take a lot of time from her lecture, but let me single out that uh, she is a member of the Brandon, uh, Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Science and Humanities in, since 2017. And she is a SIAM fellow and also an IEEE senior member, uh, which reflects our visibility both in the community of applied mathematics, but also in computer science and uh, in electrical engineering. So without uh, further waiting, be prepared for a lot of uh, exciting material. And Gita, the floor is yours. Thank you so very much, Albert, for the very nice introduction. And I would also like to thank the organizers very much for the invitation. It's certainly a great pleasure and in particular an honor for me to give a talk here. So let me start by sharing my screen. Yeah, I think everybody knows how tremendously successful deep learning is these days. And uh, in my talk, I would like to show you a bit uh, what mathematics can contribute to deep learning, to the theoretical foundations of deep learning, and also vice versa, what deep learning can actually also contribute to mathematics, to mathematical problem setting. So I think, I mean, if we look around us, we see the tremendous impact of deep learning in particular also on public life. I mean, just think of self-driving cars, think of telecommunication, speech recognition, also think of legal issues because in the States often job applications are right now already pre-screened by these type of approaches. And then the whole healthcare sector, which unfortunately these days became even more important than it already is. Then if we get a bit closer to science, um, we saw this news just a couple of months ago, uh, where the new algorithm, which is called AlphaFold2, uh, which is a deep learning program made, as it says here, a gigantic leap in solving protein structures. And what it means by gigantic, I mean, you see, for instance, on this graph, where here you first had a stagnation in the performance, and then suddenly, I mean, it could be even called uh, like a breakthrough. Now, if we then get to mathematics, what we observe is that the area of inverse problems imaging sciences was first heavily impacted by these new type of approaches. So basically since 2012, and I mean, in various areas, like for instance, which are classical tasks, denoising, edge detection, and so on, these methods sometimes quite easily reach the state of the art. But which turned out also there is that typically the best approach is to combine these new methods with model-based approaches, now to construct hybrid approaches. And we will see also one example later on. Then the area of numerical analysis of partial differential equations was a bit slower to embrace these methods. Why? Well, because I mean, there you have a rigorous physical model in a sense, the PDE. Whereas for imaging, I mean, there's no rigorous model what an image is. So it was not initially clear why you would actually need these methods. But what turned out is that in the very high dimensional regime, neural networks 
can to some extent circumvent the cross of dimensionality and that made them that valuable also in that area. Now, everything looks very bright, but um, on the other hand, I mean, for instance, uh, basically two years ago, there was a, a big AI conference where Ali Alhimi gave a plenary talk and there he said, machine learning and in particular deep learning right now is more or less alchemy. People don't know which, let's say, neural network architecture to choose, which algorithm is the best. It's a lot of trial and error. Uh, and so this shows, I mean, this calls for a substantial theoretical foundation. But in addition, I mean, these algorithms also often have problems with trustworthiness. Uh, so as this article, for instance, says, computers can be made to see a sea turtle as a gun. You can actually easily often fool these algorithms. And maybe you've seen that in some articles with self-driving cars. Because self-driving cars recognize traffic signs. And if you put stickers on those in a particular pattern, then the car might make a completely different decision and a completely wrong decision. So again, let's go a bit closer to um, mathematics. Uh, so there was this article in the Sign News, Deep, Deep Trouble, Deep Learning's Impact on Image Processing, Mathematics, and Humanity. And it talks about the problem that, I mean, there are these new powerful methods right now, which basically swept the field of image processing, imaging sciences, but which do not have a substantial theoretical foundation. And so all of this shows that there's a tremendous need for driving the theoretical foundation further. And so from my viewpoint, I mean, there are two key challenges for mathematics in this area. One is mathematics for deep learning. So asking questions like, can we derive a deep mathematical foundation? Can we make it maybe more robust? And then on the other hand, deep learning for mathematics. So can we use deep learning to improve, for instance, solvers of imaging science problems and also PDEs? And in this talk, you will see several examples in both directions. But before I start delving more into the mathematics, I would like to also introduce you to what actually these deep neural networks are from a mathematical standpoint. Everything started with uh, McCulloch and Pitts in 1943. They wanted to design uh, algorithms for artificial intelligence. And the way they wanted to approach this problem is by mimicking the functionality of the human brain. Now, if you think back to your biology class in high school, you recall that a brain typically consists of different neurons which are then connected. So the first task would be to decide what is an artificial neuron. And so for this, let's take a look at what a neuron actually does. Uh, it gets signals in these dendrites, maybe sometimes depending on the dendrite, they are also amplified. Then in the so-called soma, those signals are collected and then the neuron decides whether and at which strengths to fire or not. So how to mimic that? Well, I mean, we have here signals x1, x2, x3 and so on, real valued ones. We have weights which mimic the amplification. And then what arrives here is x1, w1, x2, w2 and so on. Then everything is collected and summed up here, which is the sum and compared to a bias. And depending on whether the sum is larger than the bias or smaller, the network, uh, the, sorry, the neuron there outputs a one or a zero. Ah, and so now, I mean, what we will do um, then is to take these artificial neurons and to connect them to a network. But first, let me say, what flexibility is there? So what do we later on learn? And what we will learn are these weights, and the bias. Uh, so that's, these are the parameters later on of my neural network. So let's make this a bit more precise. What is an artificial neuron? It's associated with weights, W1 to WN, with the bias, B in R, with an activation function, rho, and it is defined to be this function. Uh, so you see the resemblance from the previous slide. The only difference or generalization here is that now we take an arbitrary function. Whereas before, what we did was we took the heavy side function. You know, so either one or zero, depending on whether this is positive or negative. But I mean, to have more flexibility here, I mean, one could also take a sigmoid function, so something very smooth, or this what's now called rectifiable linear unit, ReLU. 
which is the max of zero and x. And I mean, this is a piecewise linear function. It looks very trivial, but in fact, I mean, it gives very good results in practice. It's an easy function. So this is what is typically used in applications. So now we take these artificial neurons and connect them. If we do that in a mathematical setting, we get f linear maps and activation functions. So let's look at this example. All these yellow um, areas here, so these are all artificial neurons. You see, for instance, this, it gets some input, um, which is weighted. Then in here, I mean, it applies the bias, um, the activation function, and then it outputs something. The same here, input, output, input, output, and so on. So now, I mean, this we can uh, write in mathematical terms in this way. So let's look at the relation. X is in R3, so I have X1, X2, X3 here. Then these connections um, are encoded in this matrix. You see the first component of the output is this weight times X1 plus this weight times X2. So these are these two connections. Then the second component is this weight times X3, which is this. And the third component is this weight times also x3, which is this. Then b1 is um, added. That's something in R3. And the components, we now are now the biases for each of these neurons. Then we apply component-wise the act activation function. And then we keep going. Then we apply our next matrix, which are these connections, which encode these connections, and so on. Yeah, and so what you also now realize is that um, if you have here sparse matrices, this relates to very few connections. And one then says also to sparse connectivity. Now, I mean, seeing this formula, it's not that surprising how now an, a large neural network would look like. Also, we have, again, an input dimension. We have a number of layers. We have our activation function. We have these f linear maps, which we now call TL. And then a neural network is a function of this type, a highly structured function. You see here f linear maps and these activation functions applied component-wise. Now, I mean, next the question arises, what do we actually do with the neural network? And what we do is, I mean, we approximate highly complicated functions from which we just have sample values. So let's assume I have my function f, which I don't know. Maybe it's defined on a lower dimension manifold. And maybe it's a classification function. So you see here an example. Maybe in this area of the manifold, we have images of cats, and f maps them to the value 1. And maybe here, we have images of dogs, and f maps it to the value 2. Then we have samples of this function, so corresponding here, images, and which are either uh, mapped to 1 or to 2. These samples I now split into a training and a test data set. The training data set I will use, I mean, as the name indicates, for training. And the test data set I will use later on for checking the performance of the trained network. The next task is now to decide which type of network to use. How many layers? How many neurons in each layer? Which activation function? Maybe I would like to have not that many connections to start with. Then I need to pre-select entries of these matrices to be equal to zero. Once I've decided upon that, then the training starts. So I need to now learn, as we said before, the entries of the weight matrices and the bias vectors. So I learn the F1 linear maps. How do I do that? I solve an optimization problem. What I would like is that the neural network function evaluated in these xi's should be close to f of xi. And the closeness is given by a loss function. So for instance, I can take here the square loss, so the difference squared, or also others. And then I also have the means to incorporate additional properties of the weight matrices and the bias vectors. Maybe I would like them to be sparse. Then I would put the little r1 norm around here. I then solve this optimization problem. And I do that typically by stochastic gradient descent. Gradient descent would not be a good idea because usually I have millions of training samples and I certainly don't want to compute millions of gradients. So basically what I do here is I always take a random subset which I then view as an average. Once I've solved this, I get my new network 
And now I hope that this is close to my initial F. And this closeness I now check with the test data set. So from the test data set, I input the XIs in my network function and hope that I get correctly F of XI. Now, why is this program that effective these days, which it was actually not when McCulloch and Pitts started it? There are two reasons. One is that we have now a huge amount of computing power, so we can train very deep neural networks. And I have also a huge amount of training data uh, because of the age of data we live in. Still, I mean, it's, it's a big mystery. And let me explain to you a bit, I mean, what, uh, why this is actually a mystery. Now, you see, I mean, um, let's say you would like to do classification. And let's assume, again, I have two different data sets. So I, again, let's say, want to separate cats from dogs. I have these green dots, let's say these are cats, and the blue stars, which are dogs. If my network doesn't have much capacity and it can only do linear separation, then I do what's called underfitting. So I do, do a very bad job. If the network is a bit more flexible, has more parameters, maybe I get a separation of this type, which seems very good because this might be here an outlier. But if the network has too many parameters, there's a danger that it might enclose these points too closely. Uh, and you see then, I mean, if I then have another green or blue dot, I mean, it might end up somewhere in the wrong class. So that's what's called overfitting. And the surprise is that neural networks actually do not overfit typically. Uh, and so this you also see here. What you see here um, on the left-hand side is classical statistical learning theory. So let me translate that to the neural network setting. Here, I mean, you have the size, the number of parameters uh, of your neural network. So the capacity of the hypothesis class. And here you have the error. Certainly, if you have more and more parameters, the training error will go down because there is more flexibility to interpolate. But the test error, will at some point go up again, and that is when this phenomena happens. But what happens nowadays with neural networks is you see, I mean, this corresponds to this part, that at some point this curve will go down again and it will go down much lower than it was already here. Yeah? And so this is, this is surprising, I mean, that neural networks behave in that way and do not overfit. Yeah, and so there's another surprise. Um, because if you look at the optimization strategy, you see that, for instance, here, I mean, you have classical gradient descent. So, I mean, you have a very nice convergence. But then, I mean, if you have um, stochastic gradient descent, you see you have a very erratic behavior, and then you might end up in a different local minima. And in addition, the landscape is actually extremely complicated. So that makes it even more surprising that neural networks behave that well. And so let me now come to the main theoretical directions which one need to attack. One is expressivity. So effects with aspects of the network architecture affect the performance. To which extent, what is the approximation capacity of neural networks to approximate the function I want to learn? And so this requires a lot of summation theory, applied harmonic analysis, and so on. Then the learning procedure. What about stochastic gradient descent? Why does it converge to good local minima? Because the problem is highly non-convex. And you see there are a lot of also other areas which contribute right now to that problem. Then generalization, which means the performance on the test data set. So the question there is what is the role of depth? Why, as we saw on the last slide, do networks not overfit? And if you're familiar with statistical learning theory, you see that these three directions are exactly the three components of a statistical learning error. The approximation by the hypothesis class, the error from the algorithm, and the out of sample error. And there's another area which I find direction, which I find also very exciting. It's a very new area. There's barely any mathematics in right now, which is explainability. You have a fixed neural network, and now you want to analyze how it performs, how it reaches decisions, what are the main input features to reach a certain decision. 
This will be not the main part of this talk, um, but since I find there's a lot of need for mathematics, let me devote one slide to explain to you what this is about. Now, what uh, one aims to do, let's say we have a neural network which uh, classifies digits, so one, two, three, four, five, and so on. And let's say the neural network classifies this correctly as a three. Then you want to know which pixels are most relevant for that decision. Oh, and so then these algorithms output a heat map here, for instance, indicating that these pixels are very important because you have this opening here. Oh, and so maybe these blue pixels play against it. Now, if the network classifies this as an eight, maybe you get a different heat map, which says the network only took care of this curve and not that much of those openings. But I mean, from a mathematical viewpoint, it is not clear what exactly is relevance what is optimality? Can we also do that for maybe other modalities like audio data? And so we have one approach which maybe gives a bit more mathematical insight based on uh, information theory, rate distortion theory. But I mean, this might be a small start, but there is a huge, it's a huge open field. And in some sense, a future vision is to uh, get explanations of a decision indistinguishable from a human being. And as you can imagine, this requires a highly interdisciplinary approach with a lot of novel mathematics. Ah, and so, I mean, from my viewpoint, I mean, these are, let's say, key directions for uh, mathematics for deep learning. So what about vice versa, deep learning for mathematics? Uh, I mean, so we already talked a bit about, I mean, inverse problems, their questions are, how do I optimally combine deep learning with model-based approaches? And also ultimately, are neural networks capable of replacing the to date existing numerical approaches? And then, I mean, if you go to the area of partial differential equations, um, you can ask the second question the same way. And in this regime, you might also wonder why do we need these very high dimensional environments? Why do neural networks perform that well in them? So now, I mean, you, if you think about it, I mean, um, what you might wonder is how do neural networks perform in this sense? And um, you see, I mean, in all these problems, a key part is uh, approximation. Because for instance, for inverse problems, what you would like is you would like to approximate the, so the solution in a certain way and also for partial differential equations. So the question you want to ask is, are deep neural networks at least as good as all previous mathematical methods? And since approximation is a key part in all of those, this would be a first part to check. Uh, so are neural networks at least capable of having that approximation capacity, which we know from all previous mathematical methods? And this is the first I would like to show you. And um, for that, I will very briefly revisit classical approximation theory. And then we will see actually that neural networks are amazingly universal and can, in some sense, perform as well as all those. Good. So what is, let's say, approximation theory about um, in, a, in a nutshell? What are the main, main questions? So let's assume I have my favorite class of functions, um, let's say in L2 RD. And let's assume uh, I have also my favorite representation system. Then I would like to measure how good this representation system is for approximating functions in my class. The way I approach this problem is to take an element of my class, and let's assume I have a budget capital N, then I'm allowed to take N elements of my representation system and build a linear combination from it. And I will do that in such a way to best approximate N. Yeah, so this is then a best N term approximation. The error which I make that way is the error of best N term approximation. And so now if I have a complete system, you can imagine that if I am allowed to take more and more elements here, if I let n go to infinity, that then this error decays. And the question is at which rate does it decay? And the largest gamma, so that this holds, is then the optimal approximation rate. So what I do here is I set into relation the approximation accuracy with the complexity of the approximating system in terms of sparsity, because what I aim for here 
are sparse expansions. I aim for expansions with very few terms. Yeah, and so therefore, sometimes one also calls this the optimal sparse approximation rate. Now, let me next fill this with life, um, show you one uh, class of functions and also one representation system, which we will then also use multiple times later on throughout the lecture. The class of cartoon-like functions is a model class for functions being governed by curvilinear structures. For instance, I mean, this happens in imaging sciences where you observe that images are often strongly governed by edge structures, but also solutions for transport equations and so on. And the elements of a model class basically look like this. So they are compact supported on the unit square and they are C2 apart from a C2 discontinuity curve. Yeah, and so you see the precise definition here. I mean, you have F0, F1, these are C2 functions. And then you have B, which is bounded by a C2 curve. Now, if we agree that this might be a reasonable model, the next question is what is now the optimal approximation rate? And also there, Dave Danoha gave an answer. He showed that um, if we have a representation system and now we need to exclude artificial ones, which are maybe um, dense in R2, then that, that is done by allowing polynomial depth search, then the optimal rate which we can achieve is n to the minus one. Uh, so that's here the gamma. So if we can construct a representation system which meet this rate, then we can say this is a system which gives optimally sparse representations for this class of cartoon-like functions. Now, there's a well-known system which is called wavelets, and you see uh, the definition basically here. I mean, you have here a generating function, uh, you have a means to move around on the plane, and you have a scaling component, so a dilation by 2 to j in both directions. So these systems come from the affine group. Uh, but I mean, with these systems, the rate you can achieve is only n to the minus one half. Why? Well, I mean, basically the problem is that you see you scale in both directions in the same way. Therefore, the essential support is like a little square. And if you approximate a curve by squares, you need many more than if you would approximate by an isotropic light element. And so there was a flurry of activity to construct such elements. And with Shielitz, there are now systems which also give a faithful implementation. So what are these shields? Um, well, I mean, again, we have a scaling component, um, parabolic scaling. Uh, and you see here, you scale in both directions in a different way. You see one element here, it's highly directional based. And the essential support is the length of two to minus J half and the width of two to minus J. Now, since they are directional based, you also need to be able to change the orientation and that you do by shearing because this ensures that you also have a faithful implementation in the end. And the definition of the system you see here, it looks very complicated, but if you take a look here at this formula, you see you have again generating function which you move on the plane. Um, then you have here a scaling, the scaling component and this additional parameter which is shearing. And the way, I mean, the reason why you set it up a bit more complicated is because in free domain, uh, you would like to have um, almost equal treatment of the different directions. And later on, the Schillet transform, which maps an F to inner products of F with these Schillet elements we really denote by SH. And with this system, I mean, we obtain now a system which gives us these optimally sparse approximations of cartoon-like functions you see the uh, n to the minus one here up to a log factor. If you view that as negligible, then it is uh, indeed the optimal rate. Uh, and um, so if you're interested in this general direction, um, we have a web page where you can also try things out. Uh, we have there several implementations in 2 and 3D of the system and also imaging applications. Now, coming back to our previous slide, which you now filled with life. Um, you see, we have now here, for instance, the cartoon-like functions. We have here shielded systems. And we saw that the rate 
n to the minus one, which is the optimal rate, it was a lower bound before, is now attained. So now we want to see whether neural networks are capable of doing the same, having the same, let's say, approximation power. And for this, what we first need to decide upon is what is actually the complexity of the neural network? How do we define that? And we do that in the following way. So this you already saw, this is just the definition of a neural network, which we discussed already before. And the complexity we now define in this way. Uh, so you see what we do. This L0 norm, counts the number of non-zero entries in the weight matrices and the bias vectors. So these are the components which we train. So what you count here is the number of non-zero parameters. And so this relates directly also to the memory requirements of a neural network. Now, so that's the complexity, that is one measure. I mean, it might not be the only one, there are a lot of different possibilities, but it's a very canonical one. And so then, I mean, later on, we will also use this notation, a neural network with L layers, this complexity, this input dimension, and this activation function. And what we do now is setting into relation the approximation accuracy with the complexity of the approximating neural network in terms of memory efficiency, because this is what this measures in truth. Now, this area of Expressivity approximation is not a new area in neural networks. It started basically when already McCulloch and Pitts started their endeavor into neural networks. And one classical result is the universal approximation theory. So this concerns functions which are continuous on a compact domain. And let's assume I have activation functions of a certain type. Then what they showed is that for every accuracy, I can find a neural network and the neural networks look like this. So they are shallow neural networks just with one hidden layer. I find a neural network which approximates that F with that accuracy. Yeah, so that's actually, I mean, an amazing result. If we have continuous functions on compact domains, neural networks can approximate, shallow neural networks can approximate that with an arbitrary accuracy. But you see the problem here as well. I mean, we don't have any control over the complexity because n, the number of neurons here can be arbitrarily large. And there are a lot of different other results in expressivity. So I apologize for every result I cannot mention here, but let me mention uh, also a result here by Jarotsky, um, where he looks at S times continuously differentiable functions. Rho is again the ReLU, which we already discussed before. Then he showed that there is a sequence of neural networks with a certain number of layers so that we can now set the approximation accuracy in relation to the complexity. So that's, a, that's it's actually a very nice result. The only downside is that this is not optimal. Now, to get an optimality result, what we require is a lower bound for the complexity. And for this lower bound for the complexity, we need to have one ingredient, which is the complexity of a function class. We took what's called the optimal exponent that comes from information theory, but you can also think here of Kolmogorov complexity. And then one can show the following result. If you have, again, your favorite function class in R2RD and an abstract learning procedure, which typically does the following, it takes an accuracy and an element of the function class and it outputs a neural network not caring about the number of layers and the complexity, which approximate that function with this accuracy. And now looking at the neural networks which are produced by this learning procedure, we can look at their complexity. And what we find is um, written here. You see the complexity, if you um, multiply this with epsilon to gamma and you let epsilon go to zero, then this product, converges to infinity. That means the complexity converges to infinity faster than epsilon to gamma goes to zero. Now, so this gives you an asymptotic lower bound on the complexity of these neural networks. And that is true for all gamma less than this, 
the complexity of the function class. Now the question is, I mean, is this result sharp? Um, and that would also lead to uh, optimal approximation, namely optimal, um, rep, uh, optimal neural networks. And so this could happen if we set gamma equal to gamma star of C. And in fact, I mean, you can construct neural networks which meet in a sense this bound. So which achieve, I mean, this learning, which would come out of a learning procedure to some extent so that this product now does not convert anymore to infinity. Now, so which have then a um, optimal low complexity. And the way we do that is by transporting classical approximation theory to this setting. So what we do now, what we do is the following in general. I mean, we take again function class, let's say cartoon-like functions. We consider a representation system, maybe shearlets, which have an optimal approximation rate for that function class. Then we take each element, so here each shearlet, and realize this by a neural network. Remember, neural networks are functions. Ah, and so let's say, I mean, I can use these neural networks uh, to encode uh, each shearlet. And then I mimic best enter approximation also by networks. How do I do that? Well, if these are my shearlets, to build a linear combination, I concatenate those in this way, and then I need to sum everything. So this would be then an n-term approximation. And if I do that, um, then what I can ultimately prove, one type, for instance, of result, is this where uh, for every epsilon and for every cartoon-like function in n, I find a neural network with this complexity so that the approximation accuracy is this n to the minus one, which we saw before, this is up to epsilon, the optimal rate. So this bound, which I showed you, uh, was sharp. And this is just part of a very general concept. Uh, what one can show in general is that deep neural networks achieve optimal approximation properties of all affine systems combined, so wavelets, shearlets, and so on. These are all systems coming from the affine group. So this is the theoretical endeavor, um, but what is maybe also surprising is that in fact, I mean, neural networks, so this learning procedure seems to be able to also, let's say, learn classical approximation theory. And so let me show you one, one um, numerical experiment for that. We now take this neural network and remember here in these compartments, we put in shearlets or maybe a different system. So what we will do now is we take this neural network, we train it on a particular function from R2 to R, and then we look at which functions it learned in these compartments. If we do that and we train the neural network, for instance, on this simple image, what it learns in the compartments are what looks like what we know as richlets. And if you take a bit more complicated functions, um, you see what we learn, what the neural network then learns, looks like something like shearlets. Yeah, so I mean, in that sense, it is maybe fair to say that neural networks here show that they are also capable of learning automatically, in some sense, what we know from classical approximation theory. Okay, so what this shows is basically that networks have an enormous approximation capacity and perform as well as all those systems, uh, what, what I just showed you. So this is, raises the question whether neural networks are even better than classical methods. And for this, I would like to take you now into the area of imaging sciences and show you that this is indeed the case, that they not only behave as well as we just saw, but even significantly better uh, in certain instances. So a lot of problems in imaging sciences are what's called inverse problems. So you have, for instance, an image here, F, which is this image. You apply an operator, which maybe takes parts out of this image, all these black dots. That gives you G, which is this. And the question would be from this, can I reconstruct my original image by basically inverting the operator? Now, in this little example, you see that it's actually extremely difficult because you have all these black parts and you can basically fill that in as you want. So that's what's called an earpost inverse problem. And the way people approach this is typically by solving an optimization problem. Now, so you minimize this functional, 
And if you look closely, what this does is here you ensure that this inverse problem is solved as accurately as possible. And in this penalty term, you have the possibility to incorporate additional properties of your solution. And um, you see what one can do here is if we have a representation system which gives sparse approximations, then if this is the correct solution, this would be a sparse sequence and then the L1 norm promotes sparsity. So to combine this with new networks, you could, for instance, first solve this problem. You get maybe not a great solution, but then you can add a neural network afterwards to maybe take care of some of the errors. Or you could also do the following. These solvers are typically iterative solvers. Um, they consist of several steps. One step is a typically a denoising step and neural networks are extremely good at denoising. So you could then replace this denoising step by a pre-trained neural network. Ah, so that's what's called plug and play. And uh, here you use what is called a convolutional neural network, a particular type of neural network. All of these solvers consist of typically proximal steps and those you can also learn by a deep neural network approach, which results then in what's called learned iterative schemes. And so what I would like to show you now is maybe some uh, an approach which combines this uh, model-based world in a bit more, let's say, sophisticated manner with uh, deep learning, following the philosophy to first use um, model-based approach as far as it goes and only use a neural network where you cannot get further. Because as we saw before, I mean, neural networks right now are still prone sometimes to failure. So therefore here with such an approach, you can actually exactly control what the neural network does. And the application is um, computer tomography. This is based on the Radon transform, the Radon operator you see here. Um, what it does is you have a function here, let's say the interior of the human body, and then you compute line integrals through it at different angles and different offsets. Now, so for instance, here you compute these line integrals. This gives you a one-dimensional function, which you put here as one slice of the sinogram. Then you rotate. And this way you fill the sinogram. And the question then is, from this sinogram, can I reconstruct my function? So the interior of the human body. That is already not that easy. It becomes much more complicated if you cannot have, if you have, don't have access to the full um, range of angles. Uh, so if you have a subset of uh, the interval from minus pi half to pi half. That's, for instance, the case in electron tomography, where you have the probe sitting in a device, and if you turn it, the rays at some point cannot get through it anymore. So that results in the problem that you have only parts of the sinogram. From those, from this, you need to reconstruct, and this causes a lot of distortions, which you see here. So, for instance, if you have a 60 degree missing angle, and if this is your original image, if you do a crude reconstruction, you get actually a terrible image. If you are a bit smarter, um, you could use sparse regularization with shear lids. So let me go back to the previous slide. Yeah, so you use this approach where now you put shear lids in here. But still, uh, you see there's a lot of blur here and here. Now we would like to combine this with, with new networks. For this, we need to delve a little bit deeper into what happens there. And um, what we do now is we look at what happens if you have access to only a very small angle and then you increase the angle. And you see the reconstruction obviously gets better and better. Yeah? But what you also realize is that at a very early stage, you already know certain singularities together with their direction. Yeah, so you face the situation that you have at a given point already some edges with the direction which are visible. For instance, if you scan and if you compute line integrals in this direction, others not because they are at this point still smeared out. And this can be made precise as a result by Quinto in this direction. Yeah, but I mean, you can phrase this um, in terms of what's called a wavefront set. So these are points on the singularity 
together with that arrangement. So what is the wavefront set? I mean, um, you see, I mean, here, these would be points on this, on this curve. Each time together with the direction, you can uh, visualize this in a phase, in phase space, where here you have the plane, and then you here you have the directionality. So each point is then mapped to one point here, which is exactly the direction of this, uh, of, of uh, direction um, perpendicular to the tangent. And so what happens here, what you now need to do is, I mean, you have only parts of the wavefront set. So some parts are missing and you need to in-paint those parts. And luckily, shielders are very good at identifying the wavefront set and also that can distinguish between the visible and invisible part. So what we now do is the following. So this is what we call learning the invisible. We first solve this sparse regularization approach, which I just showed you. We have now as an operator, the Radon transform. And here uh, we now have the shielded transform. So inner products of F with my shielded elements. And I place the L1 norm on here with some weights. That gives me F star. And we already saw F star before and realized that it has still a lot of blur in those parts. What we now do is we determine exactly what is already precisely recovered and what not. And the way we do that is we apply again the shielded transform. So again, taking inner products of F star with elements of the shielded system. Some of those inner products are already reliable and perfect. Others are close to zero. These we don't touch, but these we have to learn. And so now we train a new network from these uh, perfectly recovered coefficients to recover the other ones where we don't have enough data. We do this by so-called unit, which is a particular type of neural network typically used in inverse problems. And then we take F and we take the reliably recovered ones, we uh, compose this and bring it back to the image domain. And what you get is then you see here, these three images we already saw, these were let's say, the model-based reconstructions. This is if you use the neural network on the entire image, um, you see it's already better, but not perfect. But if you combine both worlds, the model and the um, deep learning world, you get a significantly improved reconstruction. So this shows how valuable it is to combine learning and uh, models. Yeah, so here you see, I mean, deep neural networks can outperform classical methods sometimes by far. And this philosophy, I mean, driving the model-based approach as far as it goes, complementing it with learning, you can also apply to other classical tasks, like for instance, edge detection, where you see here in our original image, this is what a human might do if she or he would be asked to detect edges. These are classical approaches. And you see here the deep learning approach where you also see the color coding indicates even which direction these edges have. So not only do you edge detection, but also wavefront set detection. Uh, so this was, let's say, a tour into uh, the area of inverse problems where I hope I showed you that their neural networks actually have a tremendous impact. Now, I mean, some of you might work also with partial differential equations um, and you might wonder why should you use deep neural networks for solving PDEs at all? I don't have that much time left, but I would like to still show you a tiny glimpse uh, to give you a flavor of why neural networks might be good to be considered. So what do people typically do? You have your PDE and then um, you use as an ansatz function instead of you, you use a neural network. Oh, and so then, I mean, you train the neural network incorporating the uh, PDE also in the loss function. And there's a lot of work. Again, I mean, I apologize. I cannot state all of those here, but you see it, ex it accelerated from 2017 on. So what I would like to show you is maybe a bit more general in a certain sense. I mean, this is uh, for parametric PDEs, where you see if you compare this now, everything is governed by a parameter Y. Now, so Y comes from a parameter space. And what you typically aim to do, one typical task is given a parameter, solve the according partial differential equation. 
Yeah, and typically always, I mean, usually you need to do this also multiple times, changing the parameter and each time solving the PDE. And for instance, if the parameter space is very high dimensional, then I mean, the computational cost can be quite high due to this first of dimensionality. So this is what we can now ask a neural network to do. So what you saw from the previous slide, now here we brought everything into the finite dimensional setting. This is the coefficient sequence. And so now we can ask the neural network to approximate this map. Uh, so let's also assume that my parameter space lives in some RP. Now, if we would have a neural network which solves this, um, it would be extremely flexible and universal approach. And we can ask also questions here like, does there at all exist a neural network which solves this task? What about the complexity? How does it depend on these key dimensions, P and capital D? And what about numerics? And so under certain hypothesis, what you can show is indeed there exists a neural network which approximates the parametric map and the complexity also depends here in a benign manner on capital B, uh, on, on the dimensions P and capital D. And then if you go a bit more into numerical computations, setting up extensive numerical experiments with always a fixed network architecture, also going to high dimensions like 91, you can also here see that also on the numerical side, this neural network seem to be able to circumvent the cross of dimensionality. So let me conclude. And I hope I showed you, I mean, that deep learning and deep neural networks show impressive performance in real world applications that a theoretical foundation is largely missing. And there's actually a tremendous need for developing mathematics and also new mathematics for those problems. And this, as I hope I also showed you, concerns almost all areas. Then there are the two key directions, mathematics for deep learning and deep learning for mathematics. And here there are directions which are particularly interesting, expressivity, learning, generalization, explainability, with the after a bit more deeply into the area of expressivity. And then concerning deep learning for mathematics, the question is, can I use deep learning for building better solvers of inverse problems and PDEs? And to co collect again, I mean, all the key questions we discussed during the talk, one of the key questions is why do deep neural networks perform that well? Then the expressivity question, which aspects of the network architecture are important? What about learning? Why does this algorithm, which usually is used these days, performs actually that well, although the problem is non-convex? The generalization question, why do large neural networks not overfit? And also why is the high dimensional regime that interesting? and more in the direction of explainability, which features can be learned. And then deep learning for mathematics, are neural networks actually capable of replacing numerical algorithms where we have worked for so many years completely? And so in that sense, I think there are really exciting future perspectives for mathematics. And with this, I would like to conclude and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Gita, for this uh, very broad and uh, inspiring uh, lecture. And uh, we can now take a few questions. So I will start with Maria Esteban, please. I think you can. Yes. Gita, great talk, really very interesting. Um, you haven't uh, talked about the cost of mixing model-based uh, algorithms with neural networks. How much uh, the cost increases, I mean, computational cost, or the time to uh, compute the solution? Yeah, so that, that's, that's a very good question. I mean, um, so the cost, I mean, concerning neural networks comes from the training phase. The training of the neural network takes actually a long time. Also, because right now it's a lot of trial and error. You have to decide which architecture to choose. You have to try a lot of things, starting values and so on. So there is a hope that uh, maybe within some years we will have a substantial mathematical foundation so that the training phase can also be quick. But then once you have trained it, I mean, then it is extremely fast. So and the approach I showed you, there actually in the running time, uh, the bottleneck is then the L1 minimization. 
from the model-based approach. So then, I mean, after the training phase, the neural network is extremely fast. And then let's say the computational cost comes more from the model-based approach. Okay, thank you. Uh, Volker Merman wants to ask a question, please. Yeah, thanks, Gita, for a very nice talk. Um, I, I would like to ask the question, how to bring in structure? So we are here at the EMS conference and structure, geom geometry or other structures are uh, deeply on the basis of, of many of the mathematical theories that we are looking at. Um, is there a good way to incorporate such structure, let's say the geometry of an object um, deeply into, uh, in a good way into these deep known neural networks? Yeah, so that's actually also a very good question. I mean, there's no, let's say, comprehensive answer to that. There are some approaches now, I mean, also, for instance, from a computer vision community to do that, to, um, let's say, maybe design parts of the neural network to take care of certain structures, components, and learn and train certain parts to, let's say, encode the structure. But overall, I mean, still, I mean, the main approach is, is usually, I mean, you have then, I mean, your training data, which uh, where the structure is embedded in, and then you hope that the neural network actually takes care of that and learns the structure by itself. So right now, I mean, in that sense, I mean, this is, this is basically the, the stage. Okay. 